Okay, so let's bring up Nathaniel Frizzell, professor, one each, W2NAF, and an update on the Personal Space Weather Station. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, yes, I am Nathaniel, W2NAF. I am professor at of electrical engineering and physics at the University of Scranton, and I'm also the lead and um, pr principal founder of the HamSci Collective. So I'm going to talk today about the Personal Space Weather Station, which I was able to speak at this same conference last year for four hours on Sunday, and back then it was just an idea. So a little history there, the, um, after we did the Solar Eclipse QSO party, Ward Silver said, you know, the next thing Hamsai should do is this personal space weather station. And he said, this is really what you should do. And I was kind of the person who was left to actually go lead the charge and do it. So here we are today. And I have some very exciting news to share about the project. So first of all, again, what is space weather? Space weather refers to the conditions on the sun and in the space environment that can influence the performance and reliability of space-borne and ground-based technological systems and can endanger human life or health. And this is the definition from the National Space Weather Program. So ham radio operators are familiar with space weather as that it can dramatically affect our HF propagation. That's how it's most commonly known. It's also good to point out that the United States has a federally mandated National Space Weather Action Plan. So there actually is a federal mandate to look at this sort of thing. And so we're interested in anything how the sun affects uh, the Earth's magnetic field, the ionosphere, and our technologies in human life. So uh, the idea for the Personal Space Weather Station really comes from something like this. This is a personal terrestrial weather station. You could buy on, say, Amazon or Walmart. You buy it all in one box. It gives you a device to measure wind speed and direction, temperature, humidity. It's multi-instrument, uh, reduces all of the data down into one nice platform, sends it off to um, a central place, and then uh, it can be used to help aid in weather predictions, but it also gives the user some local information. So that's kind of the, the mental paradigm we've been thinking. At first, it's like, oh, this won't be too hard to do. And then as we go and look into it, it turns out to be a rather complicated thing to convert this into a space weather application, but that's what we're working on. So what are some of the goals? Um, hams and who are more interested typically, and this is just a generalization, they, hams might be more interested in operations, and they might want to know the best frequencies for working DX. They might want to understand the um, RFI in the area. They might want to communicate better during emergencies. Scientists um, might generally be interested in better sampling the environment, better understanding the near-Earth uh, space environment. Now, of course, you're going to have crossover between the groups and things like that, but this is a general breakdown of where, what we might want the Space Weather Station to do. Here are a couple examples. This is, um, these are observations made by uh, Steve Ryer, WA9VNJ, who unfortunately is now in a silent key, but he made these during the 2017 eclipse, and these are Doppler shift observations of the uh, of WWV's carrier uh, that he made in um, Michigan, actually. And here you can see these positive Doppler shifts um, are the morning, and then this is the eclipse as it comes in. This is a solar flare, that little S shape there. That's the eclipse leaving, and there is the negative Doppler shifts of uh, evening time as the ionosphere goes away. So you can see this is made with a fairly inexpensive receiver setup, but you can very much see important space weather conditions in here. Also an example, a few years ago I took reverse beacon network data and I was able to uh, show that you could see the effects of a solar flare, X-class solar flare, you could see how it wiped out communications on almost all bands. And I was able to get that published in the peer-reviewed journal Space Weather. Um, so our target specifications, we want it to be useful to ham radio, space science, and the space weather communities. So this should be a useful thing for all of the people involved. We want a modular instrument design. It should be easy to add or remove instruments, and especially, especially in software architecture. It should have a small footprint, a nice user interface uh, or local display, a standard format to send data back to a central repository, and it should have an open community-driven design. Uh, so what, might, what instruments might you put on a personal space weather station? 
Uh, certainly, in a ham radio community, we're going to want a radio of some sort. So I have a software-defined radio uh, that's connected to an antenna, and it could have, um, you know, could do serve multi-purpose, be a reverse beacon network monitor, whisper monitor, PSK reporter monitor. It might also characterize high-frequency noise. Uh, we might have a GPS TEC receiver on there. We might have a lightning detector. We might have a traveling atmospheric disturbance detector. This could be connected to a, a central computer, like a single board computer, which could handle local user display data reduction and send data to the server. Uh, this radio would also need to be connected to a very stable oscillator. You need that to uh, do certain types of processing, which you'll hear about later in the morning. Uh, it might also be connected to a ground magnetometer, which can sense changes in the Earth's magnetic field due to currents uh, in the ionosphere and even farther out in space. And then all of this should go through the internet into some sort of uh, database where it can be analyzed by the people who are participating. Um, so in working on this project, so since last year we've had a lot of iterations, and what we decided to make it a best access for citizen science, we decided to split the project into two basic tracks. We have a low-cost personal space weather station and the higher performance software-defined radio-based personal space weather station. And this, one of the reasons this came out actually was because um, Tapper, you, you guys are very good at and really enjoy engineering these FPGA-based high-performance um, maybe not FPGA-based FPGA radios, um, depending on who you're talking to. But you're, <laughs> you, are very, you enjoy designing these high-performance software-defined radios. And I think there's a real place to have that high-performance category, because this could either be used by a very, very interested amateur, or it could also be used by, say, a, a professional scientist who you know, can spend a little bit more money and deploy this. But what about the case where you want to make it really accessible to schools and to younger people who maybe don't have that kind of money but want to participate? Then we have a lower cost personal space weather station. And at the time I was starting to do this, David Kasdan at Case Western Reserve University, he had already started working on a prototype for this WWV receiver, which Christina spoke about last night. So I said, well, I think there's room for both of these things in the world. So we just kind of created two different tracks that are parallel, and they all send their data to the same place so we can all use it in a common format. But that's where this came from. Uh, so this is the really big news. Uh, after Tapper last year, he kept working on this, and then we have the HamSci workshop, and at the HamSci workshop, we, in, at Case Western, we put together all sorts of ideas about what could go into this. And we decided to go after an NSF call, National Science Foundation call, for the distributed array of small instruments. This was a very specific call from the Aronomy program looking for uh, designs of new instrumentation for geospace research. And I worked with many of the people in this room and some of the people not in this room, and we actually won the grant. <laughs> so, we get it. <laughs> Thank you. So it's a total $1.3 million award over three years. And this is hotly contested in the academic community to win this grant. So the fact that we were able to do this as a ham radio community, that's a big kudos to everyone who worked on this and to the professionalism of the ham radio community. Because, and that's the other thing, now that we got this, you know, the NSF expects us to really produce something useful. There's a lot of people looking at, at us and saying, how is this really going to help? So we have to step up to the table. But I really believe we can do it, and I will also, you'll see this morning, almost all of the talks this morning are related to this project. And if you go in the demo room, Scotty already has a mock-up of the uh, Tangerine SDR. He's holding it right now. And I'll give you a slide. I have a slide later that shows where we currently are. And the progress we've had so far is amazing. So the NSF has recognized the hard work and potential contribution of the amateur radio community, but now we have a great responsibility. So this is how the teams are set up right now, uh, both according to the grant and just how people have been participating. So I'm the lead PI principal investigator, and so I'm at the University of Scranton. So I 
try to motivate and keep things organized, uh, but I don't do that in a vacuum. I take lots of input from lots of people and really rely on the expertise of the people that I'm working with. Uh, I'm also, in addition to doing the head the main project organization. I'm also working on taking on the lead for the radio science analysis and making sure the, act, the radio science on this is good. So then, at the University of Alabama, Bill Engelke, AB4EJ, who's right there, he is the chief architect of the software uh, for the central database, the control system that will allow the central uh, servers to control the personal space weather stations and also the local control software for the system. And so he's at the University of Alabama and of course a longtime Tapper member. Then Tapper and Zephyr Engineering, we have the, some of the, I'm sure I've left people off of this, but these are the people that have been very prominent so far. We have Scotty, WA2DFI, he's been the chief architect of the uh, software defined radio and the, now what's known as the Tangerine SDR. Uh, Tom McDermott has been working on the RF board, John Ackerman, and at UR, the clock module, David Witten, uh, the magnetometer, David Larson, uh, the website, and uh, they are working on designing the Tangerine SDR, which you'll learn more about this morning, the data engine, actually building the ground magnetometer. Case Western Reserve, led by David Kasdan, and we have here also uh, Christina Collins, who is slated to be the graduate student on this project, and uh, Rob Wiesler, and we have Skylar here from Case Western as well. Um, they're all part of the team working on the low-cost system. New Jersey Institute of Technology, we have Gareth Perry from there right now. He's a collaborator on the project. Hyoming Kim is going to be the official PI giving oversight to the uh, science uh, in calibration of the ground magnetometer. And then we have also in the room a uh, major collaborator, Philip Erickson, WNPJE, uh, from the MIT Haystack Observatory. He is a science collaborator and advisor. And there are many, many other people as well. Uh, so current progress, we are actually well on the way. The grant does not officially start till January 1st. So we have not actually spent one single grant dollar yet. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a lot to show for what, we, for what we've done so far. And it's really been, Tapper has really come to the table to making progress here. They've set up the Tangerine SDR website. There, you can now go there and you can read all these specification documents. There's a listserv, so if you read the specification documents and you have a comment, you can sign up for the listserv and you can give your input. We have a mock-up of the Tangerine SDR. Um, and we are anticipating pro hardware prototypes as early as hamcation, potentially. That's our goal. And uh, then also for the ham side workshop and hamvention, hardware prototypes. We still have a lot of work to do on the software. Still a lot of work to do on the hardware, too. But this is, this is our goal. So how can you participate? Um, Join the Tangerine SDR list. You go to tangerinesdr.com, or there are also links from hamsci.org. Uh, we have a Monday night team speak uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern every Monday night where we talk about this on the internet. And again, join, join the list, and then you can ask for information on how to get onto team speak. We're going to have the hamsci workshop this coming March, which I'll talk about in a minute. So if you're here at this workshop, you would probably love the hamsci workshop too. So I really recommend it. And then this group has been largely self-organizing. We've been finding people who have interests and strengths in particular areas, and they say, I would like to do this, and then we say, okay, here we would love to have you do this, and um, how can we help make it doable for you? And so that's what we're working on there. So the HamSci workshop is going to, I'm proud to announce that it's going to be at the University of Scranton, where I just started as a professor. It's going to be Friday, March 20th through Saturday, March 21st. Probably want to get in Thursday night and uh, leave Sunday. And it's a beautiful campus. Um, this is my building, and we have really nice, um, uh, really nice auditorium in there and space for having this meeting. Uh, hopefully by then, we might be able to have a ham radio station on the roof as well. We, there's a little... Um, there's a radio telescope up there right now, but we're working on getting the ham station put in, so we'll, that's another goal. <laughs> um, so we have any, we welcome any papers related to development of the personal space weather station, atmospheric science, atmospheric science, radio science, radio astronomy, um, etc. Or if you just want to come watch, you are welcome to do that. 
so we strongly recommend it. Now, here's the part where I told Steve Bible to pay attention. So, if you look behind the building here, there are railroad tracks. And so, Scranton is known. Yes, Scranton is known as Steamtown,、um, and it has a national historic site called Steamtown, which is actually a national park. And it's just a couple minutes away from the university. It's a free exhibit, and they have it's a national heritage site where they have full-sized steam locomotives. So, what's that? Yes,、yeah, so you could even try it. if there's someone who wants to try and arrange a parks on the air. Contact me, and I can try to put you put you in touch, and we can try and arrange all of that ahead of time too. So yes,、yeah, so here here's another reason, just one other reason to come to Scranton. We have.、Um, Steamtown. There's an airport just 15 minutes away, the Scranton、uh, Wilkes-Barre Airport. I got a direct flight from、um, there to here, which、uh, was very, very fortunate for me. So if you're in the Michigan area, it's probably a direct flight for you.、Um, so that's all I have for now. Thank you.、Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the morning. Uh, as you listen to the rest of the talks、uh, about this project and about the science that this project is going to enable, thank you. So, as you can see, there's a lot of exciting work going on right now. If you were, if you had friends that say, "What are you doing in ham radio?"、Um, Today, I would say citizen science would be your answer. So, HamSci is one option to get involved with citizen science, and of course, tomorrow at the Sunday seminar with Satnogs, that's another opportunity for citizen science. So, this is kind of an, a, an exciting genre for ham radio today. On that, so think very strongly about that. A lot of the youngsters that you're mentoring in ham radio. Introduce them to citizen science. What does it mean? What is it? What kind of fun can they have from that?